today's hearing is but an attempt to blame Republicans for the horrendous acts of violence. This is a blame Republicans so we don't have to take responsibility for our own defund the police and soft on crime policies. I think uh, one, if we look at the type of people committing the crimes, the breakdown of the family, and of course we have people here who've stood with, with Black Lives Matter who initially uh, was opposed to that. Just to be clear, that was a hearing this month on the topic of anti-LGBTQ violence. And yet, true to form, Republicans were eager to play the victim card and the change the subject card and the anything but let's solve a problem card, blaming the rise in violence on crime, on defund the police, on migrants crossing the border, and on the breakdown of the family. We're back with our panel. Um, Danelle. What is the, you know, as, as a student of some of these structural problems, how do you get to the, the beginning of combating this, this line where the ideology triggers violence or the ideology seeps into the mind of someone who's unstable and capable of violence, which seems like a very complicated, very intricate and, and very sort of all hands on deck mission. How, how do you begin to tackle that if, if again, you, you've got this refusal to even look in the mirror and say that as a country, we have a problem with extremism and its capacity to spill into violence? Nicole, the first thing we do in intelligence and homeland security is we look at the threat environment. Um, I point you to a Southern Poverty, Poverty Law Center report that indicates that um, from 2008 to last year, uh, anti-government groups increased by 300%. And so whereas we had in 2008 about 150, now we're looking at about 500. Um, the threat environment is rich right now for this type of activity, violent extremism. It comes from, obviously, uh, po politicians. It comes from um, conservative media, but it also comes from the Internet. It comes from uh, the dark and deep web, uh, sites we've heard about, uh, the lack of content moderation. And the fact of the matter is, and I hate to say this, hate sells in this country. And mm. many see the division of America as an enterprise that, that can gain them either votes or clicks or cash. And we can, <laughs> don't have to look that far past someone like Nick Fuentes and some of these other people who are in this threat environment that are stoking this type of hate. We have ignored the domestic violent and domestic extremism problem for many, many years. And now it's coming back to bite us. And it's coming back to bite us because they are enabled now by technology, particularly the social media aspect. But also you have people who are so-called influencers who are stoking this. The last thing I'll say is that it, the, the, the part that, that I find interesting, once again, as a student and as a professor of Homeland Security, is this constant friction between security and safety and privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties. There's never any equilibrium. And so a lot of, most mm -hmm. of these hate groups, they hide behind the First Amendment until they go operational. And there's a very limited time between the time that they decide to go operational and they become violent to interdict them. They also hide behind the Second Amendment. And these groups for decades yes. have amassed have amassed weapons and tactics, techniques, and procedures that make them very, very lethal now. Yeah, it is. It's the First Amendment while they're talking about it, the Second Amendment while they're planning it, and the right to privacy that they don't see in reproductive rights when they're um, operational. It's amazing. Um, Pete Strug, I want to read to you some revelations from the January 6th report that we haven't gotten to yet here on this show. Um, it's not just people willing to tell the truth and, and if they see something, say something. Mitch McConnell, of all people, was on the phone with Donald Trump's national security advisor warning that ex-military represented a threat to President-elect Joe Biden. Let me read some of that reporting to you. Two days after pro-Trump rioters attacked the U.S. Capitol, then national security advisor Robert O'Brien got a call from Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell and an aide who asked him to look into something he'd been hearing. Retired military personnel sympathetic to Trump might be preparing to prevent Joe Biden's inauguration. Quote, he was concerned that there were reports 
that there were retired military personnel who were sympathetic to the president and might be organizing, O'Brien said in the interview. McConnell's own national security aide, Robert Karam, was on the call as well and raised similar concerns about Navy SEALs, O'Brien said. That's from reporting in Politico about the O'Brien transcripts being um, part of this final report. I, I know the right went nuts when the new defense secretary and Pentagon leaders sought to examine extremism in the military. Um, and I wonder, Pete, what you make of our ability to at least shine a light on it as, as a first step to combating it. Well, Nicole, that uh, episode with McConnell is absolutely chilling. And I think it is an area that I'm really concerned about, about radicalization within the military ranks and within law enforcement as well. But you're absolutely right. I mean, when you look at the last National Defense Authorization Act that was just passed, I guess, a couple of weeks ago, there were several measures, maybe six or seven measures, that had funding for the Department of Defense to do studies and to look at the phenomena of radicalization within the officer corps, within the enlisted corps, to figure out how big the problem was and what might be done to combat it. But because it has become such a political issue, all of those measures were stripped out of it. They almost zeroed out all the funding that had been proposed for taking, even just taking a look at the problem to figure out whether or not it was an issue, how broad an issue it was, and what might be done. We're not even going to give money to take the first look at that. And the issue at the end of the day, I mean, I completely agree with Donnell that there is a profit motive behind it, but there's also a political motive. I mean, we had Marjorie Taylor Greene in her text, I think Mark Meadows saying, talking about all the QAnon people saying, these are my people. My there people. are people right now in Congress who have as their constituents who put them into power, adherence to QAnon and some of these other extraordinarily dangerous groups who have violent ideologies at their fringes. And so it's not just a profit issue, it's a political power issue as well. And before we do any work to look at this, you're going to have to have some sort of political will to do it. And I just don't see that coming out of the Republican Party, at least not for the next two years. I mean, A.B., it seems that voters intuited some of this, but it, uh, it also seems like there's an opportunity for Democrats to be really blunt with the American people. Not all Republicans are domestic extremists prone to domestic terrorism, but all the domestic extremists prone to domestic terrorism are Republicans. So says Chris Ray. Right. But I, I just uh, I, I, I see that you know, the the average House member trying to make that case to the American people is not going to break through the way that Merrick Garland and Chris Ray and Joe Biden uh, are going to. And they are really boxed in because Republicans are exacting this leverage um, that's being described here on on our um, on our on the Biden administration, on our Department of Justice and our FBI. If you have uh, a system to track threats, to school officials and school board members and school nurses, you are, quote, targeting and censoring Republican voters. Um, if you uh, prosecute people who tried to overthrow the election and, and were responsible for the deaths of several people um, in, in the insurrection at the Capitol, um, they are political prisoners. It, it, everyone is a martyr, as described by the Republicans, and all of the use of our justice system um, to bring them to justice is um, is an abuse, and uh, Republicans are not going to go after the threat of domestic extreme extremism, which is a threat around the country to American to the American people, and they will never, as Pete just pointed out, touch the internal threat, the the radicalization of law enforcement and and the military from within. We have one party abdicating their oath to the Constitution and their duty. Uh, to keep Americans safe and and to have a, a, an effective and trustworthy and credible government. Um, and their, the political power of their narrative is so energizing to their quasi-violent base. Um, it, is, it is extremely troubling, and I think they have a very strong upper hand. It's so harrowing. And, and Barbara McQuaid, as everyone's talking, I'm thinking about Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony um, about what Donald Trump said about his armed supporters on January 6th, when he said, take down the mags and let them in. They won't hurt me. Do you think the the why is that Republicans think they don't represent a threat to them? Because I, I still struggle with the why. I think that they see political advantage in protecting that group and advancing that narrative. You know, I think that uh, Donald Trump has been very successful 
in exploiting differences in this country. They were already there, differences between conservatives and progressives. But Donald Trump has done all he can to stoke those divisions and push people to more extreme versions of themselves uh, and to put them at war with each other. You know, when, when I was in college, I'm sure uh, you, you thought this as well, Nicole, um, you could have different views on things like affirmative action and abortion uh, and immigration and gun control. Um, you might be in favor of one and opposed to another, but now it is all or nothing. You are for us or you are mm. against us. And political rivals are not just our political opponents. They are demonized. They are the enemy. Uh, there was one um, member at a, a Trump rally who said, it's Team Trump versus Team Lucifer, and it's not difficult to decide. And so when there is that stoking of and demonization of the other, uh, people are uh, turned against their neighbors and their friends. It reminds me, Nicole, of the work that we did in the Bush administration and in the Obama administration at the Department of Justice that we called CVE, Countering Violent Extremism. Then it yeah. was focused against ISIS and al-Qaeda, and nobody had a problem with any of that. Now that the right. threat is coming from people like the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys and the Free Percenters, we should see everybody rallying around that effort as well to build that resilience. And yet I see one party abandoning their responsibility to the people.